Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Paul Kushner. I'm a professor in the Department of Physics here at the University of Toronto. Um, and it's uh, my great pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce tonight's program. Um, this is the 18th Tuzo Wilson Lecture, uh, named for uh, the founder of Geophysics in Canada and one of the great Earth scientists of our time. Uh, he passed away in 1993. The lectureship was established in 1995 along with a chair um, and uh, Professor Stephen Morris um, is uh, the current Wilson chair and he organized this event and I want to acknowledge uh, his work in that and also uh, the help of uh, uh, Chris Dolio from uh, the Department of Physics in putting this all together. So I'd like to acknowledge the full time. What I've heard about, about uh, uh, Tuzo Wilson is not somebody I, I knew personally, but whose influence in the department where I studied here uh, was great, and uh, the friendships <coughs> that he established here uh, led, were, were really reflect in this series. Uh, the chair was established by his friends. Um, he had a great influence on many, many people, both uh, through his uh, fundamental uh, uh, theoretical work and also through all the field work he did, and you see some of that exemplified in the slides here. Um, uh, he, he went on uh, from the University of Toronto to the Ontario Science Centre and back and forth uh, and there touched the lives of many people bringing science to a broader audience and uh, I would say that combination of, of, of going in the field, of observing uh, earth processes, um, deriving incredible theories of plate tectonics and, and fundamental insight and then sharing that message uh, with a broader audience uh, is, is really what this series is about and it's what uh, tonight's speaker uh, is about as well. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Susan Lozier, who's the uh, professor, the Ron, Ronnie Rochelle Garcia Johnson Professor of Earth and Ocean Sciences at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, Dr. Lozier leads a dynamic international observing research program called OSNAP, which we're going to hear about uh, this, uh, this evening, on the overturning circulation of the ocean using observations gathered across the vast domain of the subpolar North Atlantic. Uh, the challenges of doing this research in this kind of this, this very challenging environment are exemplified by the image on the poster for tonight's program. So if you haven't had a chance to see um, the, uh, the, the graduate student in the act of capturing ocean data uh, and how hard it is, you really have to see that if, if the poster is outside somewhere. Um, so we'll be hearing about some of this groundbreaking research uh, from, from OSMAP and, and other examples. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, and the American Meteorological Society. Uh, and this year she'll be presented with the Ambassador Award of the AGU for her exceptional scientific leadership, uh, not just in contributions uh, through OSNAP and, and, and other uh, programs, but also uh, the fact that she established an important mentorship program for women in physical oceanography, which is the field she's representing here, uh, which is a classically heavily male-dominated uh, area. Uh, she currently serves also as the president of the Ocean Oceanography Society and as vice Pro uh, provost for uh, strategic planning at Duke. So she's really doing a, a great service uh, to her community through her leadership in various ways. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to, to, to visit uh, with Susan uh, these past uh, couple of days, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing her lecture tonight. So join me in welcoming her, uh, uh, Dr. Susan Wilson. start by thanking the Department um, of Physics here at the University of Toronto for the invitation. Um, it's a great honor to deliver the 2016 uh, Tuzo Wilson Award. Considering that many geoscientists like me spend a good portion of our days pushing keystrokes, it's quite an honor to deliver this lecture from in honor of a man who apparently moved mountains. So that's a, that's a, a, a great honor. I also want to thank my host, uh, Professor Stephen Morris, for the invitation. He's been a great, gracious host and I appreciate it. My first visit to the University of Toronto, my first visit to Toronto. So I plan to come back from what I've seen. So it's been great. So uh, my the focus of my talk this evening is the ocean. Now, centuries ago, thoughts about the ocean uh, summoned feelings of fear, perhaps some awe, and certainly some mystery. But to one man, the ocean invited curiosity. So I'm going to take you back to 1751. And in 1751, there's a British sea captain named Henry Ellis. And Henry Ellis was the captain aboard a slave trader, so he was transiting from West Africa over to the American colonies. 
and he stopped um, in the middle of the torrid zone to take measurements of the deep ocean. So this was decades before Benjamin Franklin charted the Gulf Stream. And Captain Ellis had been asked by Reverend Stephen Hales back in England to stop and with a bucket that had been fitted with valves and a very, very long rope to take some measurements of the deep ocean. So Captain Ellis and his crew stopped in the middle um, of the Atlantic <coughs> and with that bucket slowly lowered it over the side, brought the bucket up after it reached a certain depth, put a thermometer in, and they, they, he wrote in his letter that the thermometer was, was a thermometer of Mr. Fahrenheit's made by Mr. Bird, recorded the temperature, and then lowered the bucket a little bit further, and then kept bringing it up, recording the temperature, and kept doing this over and over again. And he recorded in the letter that the cold of the water, the temperature of the water, decreased in proportion to the depth, till they lowered the bucket to a depth of about 3,900 feet. And then from then on, no matter how much further they lowered that bucket, the temperature always came up the same, which was about 30 degrees colder than the air temperature that they recorded. Now, Captain Ellis wasn't that interested in these measurements. And at the end of the letter, he wrote to, to uh, Stephen Hales. He said, well, we hope this is of interest to you. We thought at first it was just a uh, mere food for curiosity. But we did discover that we now found a, a cold source uh, to cool our wines and cool our baths and our pleasure. He said, it's vastly agreeable to us in this burning time. They were very happy to have discovered that cold water. That letter, Reverend Stephen Hale, sent that letter on to the Royal Society of London where it sat for decades. And not until 1800, nearly 50 years later, did Count Rumford, an American-born British scientist, who many of you may have heard about uh, Rumford fireplaces, he was the father of heat convection, so he stumbled upon this letter, and he was very puzzled. And he was very puzzled because he could not figure out how the water at that depth in the torrid zone, in the equatorial zone, could be that cold. Why was that water so much colder than the surface air temperatures? And so after thinking about this for a while, um, Count Rumford um, wrote that he could think of no other supposition than the fact that those cold waters must have come from cold currents at the poles. And so then he said, well, that, with that cold at depth in, the, in this torrid zone, if that cold water originated from the poles, then there must be a supply of warm water at the surface to counter, uh, to compensate for the cold water at depth. And without those two sentences, Count Rumford described over 200 years ago what today has been properly called the ocean conveyor belt. So the ocean conveyor belt, as Rumford described it, is during the winter, waters at surface in the very high latitudes become very cold and dense. They sink. They sink to great depths. They're denser than any of the water equatorward, and so those waters start flowing equatorward. Those waters must upwell somewhere, so they slowly upwell in distant parts of the globe, and then at the surface, those waters return back to the high latitudes. So that conveyor belt was first um, was first described by Count Rumford um, in 1800. Now it was many many decades later, um, almost 100 years ago, where what Count Rumford surmised. Um, Oceanographers really tried, were able to uh, draw the connection between the tropical waters and high latitudes. So from that single profile temperature, he said, well, they, that water could have come from no other place than from the high latitudes. But the Germans were the first um, oceanographers that, uh, aboard a ship, took measurements um, from, um, basically, they, they produced the first section, in this case it's salinity, and along 30 degrees west. And so in the, the expeditions that they ran in the, in the late 20s, what you're looking at are constant contours of salinity. And we're looking here at depth, and this is running from 70 south to 60 north. And so what you're seeing is the very salty water that originates at high latitudes. And this water from the North Atlantic is filling the deep ocean. So when Henry Ellis was measuring here in the torrid zone, after um, about 3,900 feet, he was getting into water that originated at high latitudes. 
So since the 1920s into the 30s and 40s, European oceanographers, uh, North American oceanographers, were aboard ships busily making these transects, measuring the temperature, salinity, and oxygen, and really gave a spatial context to the origin of the waters um, at depth. But it wasn't um, until the uh, 70s when the overturning was put in a temporal context. So during the 1950s and during the 1960s, both uh, the Soviet Union and the United States conducted nuclear a bomb test. And a byproduct of that nuclear bomb test is tritium, which before that time had really been in negligible quantities uh, in the ocean. So the tritium was taken up by the ocean uh, surface. And in the 1970s, as part of a geochemical ocean section study, um, geochemists set out to measure this tritium that was in the ocean and find out uh, where it was. So we're looking again at a section. This is with, excuse me, this is with uh, depth here. And then we're looking at latitude. And we're looking now at contours of this tritium or helium-3, again, the byproduct of nuclear bond testing. And so we can see, essentially, the overturning in action because these, uh, this tritium is taken up by the surface of the ocean. And we see that here at the high lines of the North Atlantic, where we have this really deep mixing going on in the winter, where the ocean has lost all this heat, the waters become very dense. So whatever properties of the surface then are being taken up um, and being carried to depth mix. And then the overturning circulation then is moving these waters from the high latitude to the low latitude. So prior to this, we saw the temperature, salinity, and oxygen signals um, and understood the spatial pattern. But with the geochemical tracers, now this is really for the first time we could see the overturning in action. So here was an encroachment then of this quantity that had been in the deep ocean before, and we could see it being brought through uh, the deep ocean. So the understanding of the deep ocean as a reservoir really started uh, to come about. Now, the appreciation of the ocean um, as a reservoir then um, really uh, started to take um, hit hard when um, oceanographers started studying the amount of anthropogenic CO2 that was in the ocean. So let me explain to you what you're seeing here. So again, we're looking at what we call a cross-section. So this is depth. And this distance now is the distance along this red line. So we're looking, uh, if we pretend that we are on a, um, a ship, and we started um, in Iceland, go down all the way through the Atlantic, go across the Southern Ocean, and then go up the Pacific to the Aleutians. If we pull out that red line, and zero kilometers would be here in Iceland, and we go 30,000 kilometers later, we would end up at the Aleutians. And along that track, we're going to measure the concentration of the anthropogenic CO2. So the CO2 that has been produced by the burning of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. And here we see that we have high concentrations in the surface waters. But where we see the concentrations at depth here are in the North Atlantic. And this, just like we saw the penetration of the tritium, the helium-3, this penetration of that anthropogenic CO2 is the action of the overturning circulation. It's carrying what it has um, obtained, that property it's seen to the surface, and then moving it down to depth. And we fully expect when we measure this again that we'll see that encroachment, that penetration in the, other, in the other parts of the ocean. So we've always known that the overturning circulation was the way that the ocean was a heat reservoir, but now we understand that it's a reservoir for the anthropogenic CO2. So decades ago, when people measured how much anthropogenic CO2 was in the atmosphere, there was always a missing sink. And so there was a saying about where has all the carbon gone? Well, today we understand that about 30% of the anthropogenic CO2 is in the ocean. And that is appearing in the surface of the ocean, but also um, in the deep ocean. So it's a critical question when we think about the climate and the evolution of the climate. It's really a critical question to what extent will the ocean continue to be a carbon reservoir? Now, the uptake of the carbon depends critically on biology and chemistry and physics, but the storage of that, this storage of the, or the, excuse me, the uptake and then the storage of depth is really all about the physics. And it's really all about to what extent we keep overturning the waters and the extent to which we keep 
moving those, this carbon dioxide away from those high latitudes into the rest of the ocean. So the um, understanding of the fate of the ocean as a carbon reservoir hinges critically on our understanding of the overturning variability. So how well do we know the overturning variability? Well, just maybe 10 years ago, I would have told you we know that overturning vari variability really well. Um, I would have sort of relied on the same paradigm that uh, Rumford started in 1800. I would have said, well, we have every expectation that as warming or freshening at high latitude continues, we start stabilizing those waters at high latitude, making those waters harder to mix and harder to overturn. So if we warm and freshen the waters, we expect there to be less overturning, that conveyor belt would weaken, we would bring down less carbon, and we would also return less warmth uh, to the high latitudes. And so that scenario, that paradigm, has been used to explain a lot of things in our climate, especially has been used to explain uh, global uh, climate changes on paleo paleographic timescales. So changes in global temperatures on millennial timescales have been interpreted in the context of this conveyor belt uh, paradigm. And certainly, we have been interested in the extent to which that paradigm can be used to explain changes um, on modern time scales. So the world between physical oceanographers and paleoceanographers was really quite separate because we always assumed that the overturning circulation changed on very, very long time scales. But there was a study in the 1990s that really sort of removed <coughs> the distance between the um, remove the distance between the paleo-oceanographic paleo world and the modern um, oceanographer's world. Um, because there was a study in the 1990s that came out, and it looked at the synchronous changes reported in ice sheets between um, Antarctica and Greenland, and it found that the global air temperature, changes in global air temperatures, could happen on the time scales of years or decades rather than on timescales of millennia. So all of a sudden, the term abrupt climate change in the late 90s and early part of this millennium really um, came into part of our lexicon. And sort of the distance between the world of paleoceanographers, where people talked about the overturning circulation changes um, creating global temperature changes, people really started thinking about that on the modern time scale. And so abrupt climate change 10, 15 years ago became the concern of, um, of many people in the modern physical oceanography world, in climate science, um, and in climate policy as well, and to the dismay um, of many scientists also in Hollywood. <laughs> and so in 2004, there was a movie, The Day After Tomorrow, that came out that blamed the ocean conveyor, cell, um, ocean conveyor belt for starting um, an ice age. Apparently in Hollywood, geologic time scales are measured in hours, so it's all played out in 24 hours. And that ice age was supposed to happen in, uh, in Northern Europe. Apparently either the Statue of Liberty was in Northern Europe or something happened there. <laughs> but not just in Hollywood, but in um, uh, the scientific literature, the concern about abrupt climate change was real. And so there was a study that was put out in 2005 where some uh, oceanographers uh, looked at data that had been uh, gathered over five decades in the North Atlantic. So moving along this transect at 26 and a half degrees north, there had been five occupations, meaning that ships one time each decade had moved across this latitude, taken measurements of the temperature salinity, and from that had estimates of the overturning circulation. And from their data, they estimated that the overturning circulation had declined by 30% over five decades um, and was still declining. And so 16, 11 years ago, there was a real concern about a very real slowdown in the overturning circulation. Um, and that, that a very real slowdown in the overturning circulation would have very real consequences for regional um, and global climate. So the ocean community, um, both on this side of the um, Atlantic and the other side of the Atlantic, there was a lot of concern then about trying to understand the possibility um, of, of climate change. 
So a lot of modeling studies, a lot of observational uh, studies. But one thing uh, that oceanographers agreed on early on was that the nomenclature of calling this a conveyor belt uh, needed to change because there was no mathematical or physical construct that we really understood about the, the conveyor belt. And so we started referring to this feature, this large-scale overturning, as the meridional <coughs> overturning circulation, or MOC. And since most of those deep waters that fill the global ocean are in, uh, formed in the uh, North Atlantic, we refer to this as the AMOC, the Atlantic, Atlantic Marion Overturning Circulation. But even though we changed the lexicon, we still borrowed from the paleoceanographers sort of the, the construct of how we expected the overturning circulation, uh, what we expected it to look like, and how we expected it to behave. So 10 years ago or so, when, even though we were now talking about the overturning circulation, we still had these, um, these five assumptions. So we assumed that the overturning varied on fairly large timescales, on years to decades, um, that it wasn't something that would vary on timescales of days to weeks. Uh, we assumed that we could measure the water, uh, and uh, these reasons will become apparent in just a moment, that we could measure the, the lower part, the lower limb of that overturning circulation just along the boundary currents. We also understood that the Gulf Stream waters were what carried the waters, the throughput, the upper limb of the waters were carried by the Gulf Stream. Um, we assumed that the overturning circulation was essentially like um, a, a pipeline, you know, a pipe where we could measure one, the flow at one place and we would know what the flow is at another place. And finally, the fifth assumption was the assumption that the overturning variability resulted because we had a variability in that mixing of high latitudes, how many deep waters were formed. So I'm going to walk you through each of these assumptions and tell you about what we understand about them now to give you an idea of our understanding, current understanding um, of the overturning circulation. So starting um, shortly after that report came out in 2002, the US and the UK uh, oceanographers teamed together to measure directly for the first time the overturning circulation. So prior to that, um, oceanographers were just taking measurements of the property fields, the temperature salinity, not measuring the currents. And so starting in 2004 at 26 and a half degrees north, um, the U.S. and U.K. put together an Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation um, Array, and this array is called Rapid. And so here we're looking at that section, and along that section there are moored arrays with instruments at various depths. Um, and um, in addition to this, there are satellite measures that are used to get the estimates of the wind-driven um, surface currents. Um, and the, this, this um, system, starting in uh, 2004, is continuously monitoring uh, the overturning circulation. After one year, they pulled up the instruments, got the data, put it back in, and after one year, um, the time series looks like this. Now what I want you to pay attention to is really this red line. This is a measure of the overturning, the amount of water that is moving northward, and then we have to have a comparable amount of water coming back. And this is showing us from when they first put the array in uh, to when they pulled it up after one year. They, they put it back in, but this is the first year data from March of 24 to March of 2015. And we're looking at what are called spare drips, which is just how many millions of cubes of water uh, per second. So this is a, tra a transport measurement. The magenta, black, and blue, those are all the different components. They add up to the red. The important thing here is that we, if you recall, that the expectation was that prior to this, the overturning circulation over five decades had declined by 30%. And that was from what we call synoptic measurements by these ships going across the Atlantic. So what you see that over the course of a year, the overturning circulation varied by a, a factor of six. And so looking at this turned our expectations you know, around because those prior measurements where somebody went out in a ship that took three or four weeks to go all the way across and we thought that that overturning circulation they were estimating was the overturning circulation for that year, it's totally not true. And so we understood then that there's a lot of high frequency variability 
uh, of the overturning circulation, and so whatever we thought it was before from those measures, we could no, we no longer held true. So we understood that we have all this um, variability in the overturning circulation that we didn't that we didn't understand before. The next assumption uh, we had understood that um, our past measures of the overturning circulation, uh, or past measures of the deep water. Were, we would be fine if we just looked in the boundary currents, the deep western boundary currents. And so this came from um, a theoretical argument in the 1950s from uh, someone named Henry Stommel, who was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And the theory held that if you have a mass source of water at high latitudes, and that mass source fills the deep ocean everywhere, those waters that uh, are upwelled, the dynamics are such that the upwelled waters um, need to be supplied by poleward flow everywhere in the interior. So poleward, if everywhere in the interior the ocean is poleward flow, then along the deep western boundary currents, the basin is the only place where the high latitude mm -hmm. waters could move. So starting in the 50s and 60s, whenever oceanographers wanted to look at these at the lower limit, the overturning circulation, they just went to the deep western boundary current and measured the properties there and measured the transports there. But starting in the 80s and starting in the 90s, we started having some ideas that not all of those deep waters were just coming through these conduits. And so a colleague of mine, uh, also from Woods Hole and I, decided to track the um, waters from high latitude using what are called Lagrangian floats. So using floats that move with the water. So here what I'm showing you, um, is a uh, moored sound source, and this is this device will give a signal every uh, day, and then its uh, signal is picked up by these floats, which have hydrophones on, and they are listening for this uh, sound source that's being put out. And so we uh, moored many, many, about five or six sound sources in the subpolar North Atlantic, and then over a course of three years. Um, <coughs> Every three months, we released floats at this site on um, Canada, the Bonavista site here, in conjunction with some Canadian scientists from the Bedford Institute. And um, we released these floats, and then they were tracked. So we're releasing them right in the deep western boundary current, right where we expect the, vi the deep waters from high latitudes have been formed. These waters are formed in the Labrador Sea, and they're also formed in the Arctic Seas, and spill over sills in, into the North Atlantic. So we were expecting these floats to travel nicely down uh, the deep western uh, boundary current after we have released them. And what I'm showing you here are the trajectories of those floats. So here is the release site of those, and each of these lines tracks the path of one of those floats over two years. The colors represent the change in temperature that the float sees from, or the float um, has, since its launch. So rather than flowing down this pipeline along the deep western boundary current, these floats showed us an ocean that is much more variable in space and time than what we had expected. So centuries ago, people thought the deep ocean was motionless. But even when I was a graduate student, I thought the deep ocean was much more laminar than what we're seeing here. And so actually following the pathways here, uh, really we understood that these deep waters are coming down, carrying the anthropogenic CO2, There's, um, their spreading pathways were far different than what, than what we had anticipated. So our idea of the ocean overturning as conveyor belt also started really um, altering. So the third assumption that we've had has to do with the surface pathway. So most people, when they uh, talk about or learn about the conveyor belt, they learn that the Gulf Stream is the upper limb um, of that conveyor belt. Now the Gulf Stream itself is largely wind driven, but there is a component um, of the Gulf Stream waters that um, constitutes what we call the throughput. So what we're looking at here um, is a sketch of the surface currents that was put together in the year 2000. This was put together from all the different surface drifters that had been deployed in the North Atlantic over, let's say, 10 or 15 years prior to this. So these surface drifters were are deployed everywhere, and then this oceanographer, Dave Frantoni, looked at all those tracks of the surface drifters and made this, uh, this, <coughs> this is really this one red ribbon is tracing out what we think of as the upper limb 
um, of the overturning circulation. So here the warm waters are coming from the tropics through the Florida Straits, here's the Gulf Stream, and here are the waters that bring their warmth uh, to the, uh, the British Isles in Northern Europe. And this, um, these waters, this Gulf Stream pathway is, has always been, um, uh, or excuse me, this warrant here has always been attributed to that, to those Gulf Stream waters that are moving north. So ever since Matthew Fontaine Murray, who was a 19th century U.S. naval officer, was the first one who um, attributed the warmth of British Isles in northern Europe to the Gulf Stream. So if we go at Conf, all of you know this quite well, that at comparable latitudes, the British Isles are much more hospitable, I won't say habitable, but hospitable <laughs> than comparable latitudes. And certainly not to this crowd, I won't say that, uh, than comparable latitudes um, in Canada. So one of the reasons, in addition to the, I'm just caring about the overturning variability in terms of the anthropogenic, uh, a reservoir for anthropogenic carbon, is changes uh, in the overturning circulation that we've always understood could potentially impact the temperatures of these waters. And then as the westerlies move across and pick up that heat, those air temperatures then, um, or that heat then influences again uh, the regional climates of British Isles. So this surface pathway has been has been much studied. So um, a study though um, in, about ten years ago really uh, caused us to reconsider what Matthew Fontaine Murray thought um, nearly 100 and 150 years ago because it turns out that if you take all those surface drifters and instead of just um, taking their velocities in individual areas and averaging them and looking at them in that way, but instead you just plot the tracks of the surface drifters, it turns out that you can't find a path from the surface of the, of the Gulf Stream to those high latitudes here. So wherever you see a gray asterisk is where surface drifter has been deployed here in the subtropical North Atlantic. And then all the black trajectories are the, are the flow paths. And it turns out that only one stray drifter <laughs> up here, a free thinker, <laughs> found its way to the subpolar of the Atlantic. But where's that pathway of that warm water? All, the, the, all those surface drifters are being recirculated here in the subtropical gyre. So not only is the lower limit of the overturning circulation that we had to rethink that lower limit of structure, but our understanding of how that warmth gets up there in the subpolar North Atlantic and then on to the Arctic, we've also had to rethink that. I won't keep you hanging. The water does get there, but it doesn't get there by a surface route. It turns out that subsurface waters are coming up into, into the subpolar. But we don't have that pathway. Largely, the surface waters of the Gulf Stream are recirculating. So that um, assumption has, has also, that's the third assumption. The fourth assumption is that you can measure one place in the Atlantic, the overturning circulation, it would be the same as the other. Um, and modeling studies starting in 2007 really started questioning that. In other words, there isn't one overturning circulation. That the overturning circulation in the subtropical basin could be different than the overturning circulation in the subpolar basin. So that assumption also um, was shaping. The last assumption that I want to talk to you about is the one um, that I um, spend the most time on here. And that is that the overturning variability depends primarily on the amount of deep water that's formed. So every winter, colder winters are expected to produce a large volume of very mixed water, high latitudes, and then that's the water that's expected to be exported from the high latitudes down you know, into the tropics and then returned. So we have this expectation that there's a very strong linkage between that overturning, that local overturning, and then the large scale um, meridiana um, overturning. And why we are particularly um, interested in this question is that uh, according to the um, last assessment, of the fifth assessment of the IPCC report, um, we have, from the climate models, there's every um, expectation that we're going to have a decline. This is the 
Atlantic Meridian Overturning Starvation at 30 degrees north, 1850 to 2300. And I'm showing here two different climate scenarios. So the IPCC tests four different climate scenarios, and these are all possible scenarios. It just depends on how much greenhouse gas um, is actually um, emitted in the future. And I'm showing you these two rather uh, conservative scenarios. But in these cases, you see that there is a decline in the, um, in the overturning circulation. And that decline in the overturning circulation um, is on the order, they say, it's very likely that the AMOC will weaken with best estimates for a reduction of 11 to 34 uh, percent. I should mention, though, that in this report, they also say it's very unlikely to be abrupt. So the concerns that we had 10, 15 years ago about an abrupt change, those have been lessened. But the impact there, the change doesn't have to be abrupt um, for it to be impactful. So we know that changes can impact the amount of carbon dioxide we're bringing down. Uh, changes can impact the amount of heat we're sending northward, which have implications for ice in the Arctic, um, et cetera. And in these models, in all these climate models, the meridian overturning circulation changes are attributed to changes in the formation of those deep waters at high latitude. So uh, the question is, we have climate models showing over and over again this very, very strong uh, relationship. And the question is, do we have any observational evidence for that leakage? So I'm going to give you um, an example of one, of one study um, here done by some Canadians. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is this is the Labrador Basin. And for about 20 years, uh, scientists um, at Beverly Institute of Oceanography have maintained moorings off the Labrador uh, coast. Three moorings here, a mooring here, and they've also done hydrographic sections with their ships along those uh, lines, uh, along those lines as well. And these moorings are right in line with the deep western boundary current, which we believe is carrying all the deep waters that are formed in the Labrador Basin, and waters that are formed up in the Arctic come down, flow around Cape Farewell, and they fill the Labrador Basin as well. So over this time period, approximately uh, 20 years, the temperatures in the, of the Labrador seawater have been warming. But that indicates when those surface waters are, are warming, then there is a diminishment of the local overturning. So less and less of that deep water has been formed. So we have every expectation then we should be slowing that overturning or slowing that export of those waters. But when they went and actually looked at these different depths of the transports of the waters, there's missing records here because ocean measurements can be messy and sometimes ships can come and uh, take away your moorings and nets. Um, so, but there's been no change, clearly no diminishment. And so over those 20 years with the warming of the Labrador uh, Basin, um, there hasn't been any change in the transport of those waters. So other studies have shown for the waters that are formed. Excuse me. Other studies have shown for the waters that are formed in the Arctic Ocean and that spill over the sills. We also have not been able to find any relationship between the um, formation of those waters and the properties of those waters and the overturning circulation. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that we're looking for, we've been assuming that the overturning circulation has been operating like we think it operates on very, very long time scales, millennial time scales. We've been assuming that this overturning circulation is just being driven by the, um, this uh, loss of heat at the surface and not by wind. We've been assuming that uh, the, the forcing that, that's uh, forming these deep waters is just all due to local and not remote forcing. So the, our dynamical understanding of the um, overturning circulation, we think, has been very, very too simplistic. And we're really, in some ways, uh, you know, really trying to, after we've sort of deconstructed what we thought was the conveyor belt, we're trying to put back the pieces um, in order to understand it. So I'm going to now stop and tell you what we do know, because you may think that we hardly know anything. <laughs> but it's not true, so I don't want you to leave thinking of that. So I'm going to tell you what we do know. We know that the 
world's deep oceans are filled mostly with waters that were formed in the, in the North Atlantic. We know that those cold waters um, are returned to the surface via wind-driven upwelling in the Southern Ocean and also via mixing in places in the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. We know that the energy that's needed to upwell those waters is provided by winds and by the tides. And we know that that return, those ocean returns of the, in that upper limb of the overturning circulation provides a poleward heat flux that in partnership with the atmosphere really offsets the differential heating of the planet. But what we don't know yet is really what causes the overturning variability. And we want to know that because we want to understand to what extent the carbon dioxide will continue to come to depth. We want to understand what disruptions there will be to the regional um, and um, regional and, uh, and ocean climates. So what we do we know, I just told you what we do know. So where are we? So the linkage, the observational linkage between convective activity and overturning, that's been elusive. Now, some people could say, well, it, in large part, maybe we just don't have the data that shows it. Maybe it's there. Maybe we haven't been able to measure how large a spatial or temporal context. That's certainly true. Warming and freshening both continue at high latitudes. So what I'm showing here um, is the Arctic sea ice extent. Many of you have maybe have seen this. What you see in black is the um, seasonal sea ice extent here, September to January. That's the 1981 to 2010 average. And you can see that these five years all show less um, ice extent over each, um, over each uh, month there. Uh, when we look at the ocean temperatures in the Arctic, this is a study done a few years ago now. Here's the ocean temperatures in the 1970s, and now we're looking at the difference, 1990s minus 1970s, 2007 minus 1970s, wherever you see red, it's warmer. So as the planet continues to warm, we expect there to be more ice melt, we expect there to be warming temperatures of the Arctic, and so we expect the overturning to diminish. But we want to understand by how much and how soon. And so just knowing or understanding that it should diminish isn't enough if we're really trying to understand the, um, the evolution um, of the climate. So these changes have prompted the international community to start a new international ocean observing system in the subpolar North Atlantic. And this is the program named OSNAP. I had a 19-year-old son at the time that helped me uh, come up with this acronym. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a, a U.S.-led program. Canada is a, is a partner. Again, there are scientists at Memorial University and uh, Beckford Institute of Oceanography that are really uh, leading the um, observations in the, in the Labrador Basin. We have scientists from UK, Germany, Netherlands, France, and also China. So here we are going from the Labrador Basin. Here's the tip of Greenland. We go through the Erminger Basin, over the Iceland Basin, all the way to the Scottish Shelf. Wherever you see these dark lines and red dots, we have, starting the summer 2014, we have uh, there were five um, oceanographic um, cruises that summer putting all of these moorings in place. In addition, we have glider surveys. Here's a little glider, um, which is an unmanned uh, submersible that is taking uh, measurements in places where it was hard for us to put our, our moored instruments. We have Lagrangian floats, which I don't have to take to here, which are tracing um, the water map pathways. So this observing system from Labrador to Greenland, Greenland all the way over to Scotland, is put here. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have the observing system at 26 degrees north, and that is in the subtropical North Atlantic, but what Remember I said that what we're seeing in the subtropics is not the same as what we see in this, in this part. And here, why we're measuring here is because this, in the, sub, in the high latitude of the North Atlantic, are where the deep waters are being formed. And this is monitoring, but it's re what it's really trying to do is to um, explore what the link linkage is between the deep water formation and the large-scale overturning circulation. Um, and so we um, deployed this in 2014. We just pulled up our first round of data. Um, the last bit of it came up in September. That everything is still deployed. We hope this is in place for at least 10 years, and we're analyzing that data um, right now. So, what uh, in summary, um, 
our conceptual understanding of the oceans overturning circulation first formulated in 1800 has really uh, changed significantly. And it's changed significantly in large part because of our ability to look at the ocean in different ways. It's always been a lot easier to measure the property field of the ocean than the velocity field of the ocean. And so a lot of our understanding of this overturning circulation is based on temperature, salinity, oxygen, tritium, carbon dioxide. But when we started measuring the velocity or measuring the pathways, we started getting a very different picture of the overturning, of the overturning circulation. The, um, even though our picture, we started, started to get a conceptual understanding of the picture of the overturning circulation, what's still open, open question, is what causes that overturning circulation to vary. Um, and again, the climate models are predicting this, but today we don't have any observational evidence um, of the linkage, again, between the um, variability in deep water and the overturning um, itself. So the, um, the breadth of impacts, I think, I hope I've convinced you that it's um, of consequence because we want to understand about the uh, anthropogenic carbon burial, the heat reservoir, and the transport um, of heat. And so the international community um, has this new observing system. Fortunately, what we're hoping, the goal is that we gain a 21st uh, century understanding of the overturning circulation. And the fortunate thing is that we now have 21st century technology to measure it, and 21st century um, international partnerships. So I actually think it's more the partnerships that are really um, essential now because to carry out an observing system like this, it's really one country, it's very difficult to do, both financially and also just the North Atlantic. You know, we, the Canadians have been studying the North Atlantic for a while, the British, the French, you know, the US, and so collectively people coming together and putting together their know-how to, to pull this together is, is also essential. So we are, um, really excited to see what results will come out of this. Uh, we know it's just a start. Sometimes I think that uh, Rumford would be amazed that we have this, uh, these measurements, but I think centuries from now, oceanographers may think that we just sort of were scratching uh, the surface. But we're, we're hoping that there's light years of progress here when we get the results. So I'm just going to um, conclude um, by uh, just on, on a personal note by saying that um, I spend, I spent most of my professional career sort of analyzing data, calculating trends, and, and uh, measuring the flux of this or that. But what really brought me into this field is really the appreciation for the majesty um, of the sea. And sometimes when I'm measuring uh, the ocean or calculating things, it's very easy to forget about the majesty of the sea and the ocean and what brought me into this field uh, to begin with. So I keep above my desk a poem, and I read this, uh, to my class the first day of the, of the course I teach in geophysical fluid dynamics, and maybe some of you have heard this poem. It's called, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer by Walt Whitman. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the learned astronomer, when he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding off, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. So you see, I'm reading this to you afterwards because I didn't want you wandering off in the middle of my life. <laughs> so I purposely saved this till the end. But here at the end, I just want to encourage you from time to time to look up in perfect silence of the stars and from time to time take a moment to appreciate uh, the world's ocean that continues to inspire us and sustain us. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening. It's been an honor to deliver um, this lecture and it's a pleasure to be here in Toronto. So thank you. Dr. Lozier for a great, a, a wonderful lecture and very inspiring. Um, before we get started on questions, and we, we have.
have we have a good time for discussion. I just want to remind everybody that there's a reception after um, the Q and A, and uh, it'll just be right out out there in the lobby. Okay. So um, I actually can't see anybody very well. So, uh, uh, but we have uh, Professor Morris with his mic, uh, Crystal with her mic. Uh, so go for it. Uh, thank you. Um, one of your uh, second last slide had the word freshening on it. Yeah. And one of the items which I'm aware of is some research which is being done, <coughs> excuse me, into the increasing rate of meltwater coming off places like Iceland, right. where the water is cold, but less, so less saline than the ocean water. Right. Therefore, it may actually be a threat to the Gulf Stream. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, that's right. So, I'm not sure about a threat, but it would be, I mean, it could impact the overturning circulation. Yeah. So, anything that makes the surface waters of high latitude less dense is expected to stabilize the water column. So, we could have no changes in salinity, but if we just warm the waters, they're going to become more stable because the surface waters are less dense. Or we could keep the temperature the same, and if we made them fresher, less saline, less salty, then they would stabilize as well. And so that's something where people are trying to understand well, what is the impact of the freshening or the, or the impact of the warming. But they're both moving in the same direction, meaning making the waters of the surface less dense. So that's the, that's, the, that's the question. As those surface properties change, what happens to that mixing and then what happens to the overturning? Yes, I, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, in the data you had shown, I don't know whether I had misinterpreted that, but there might might be a trend after 2100 of a slight cooling slowly, not abrupt. Oh, you mean the IPCC reports? Correct, yes. How many, could you make a comment on that, please? I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I would feel concerned about making any comment about what's going to happen after 2100. I'm just concerned what's happening next after next election day. <laughs> <laughs> I told my colleagues I was going to Canada, they thought I was coming a week early. <laughs> okay, so after, um, I'm going to get away from U.S. politics. So you're, you're talking, so here's the, here's 2000, so this is the decline that the climate models predict. Correct. Yeah, and so you're asking after 2100, there seems to be some stabilization, is that what you're, yes, yeah. Yes. Um, why is that? It reaches a, a new state, so presumably we've used all, we've stopped, yeah, we've, we've burned all the anthropogenic CO2 we have, and so it's done. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're completely finished. So. Could you comment on the funding issues for this research, the adequacy, the sources? So one of the reasons we have seven different countries is because we need seven piles of money to do this. Um, so I mean, not, uh, not, yeah. Um, I mean, really, the seven countries are like really what I mentioned is that we have lots of expertise in lots of different countries and strong interest in this. Um, so this is the lion's share. This is being funded by the National Science Foundation, um, but every other country is putting in um, some some resources. Now it's very expensive. Um, and so what we have said is that um, we have over-engineered this because we want to get ground truthing. And so what our goal is, as we start getting the data and the return, um, we can see we can throw out some data and see if we still have a robust estimate. So the goal is to move to a more efficient operating system. And we can then ground truth the models. Because right now the models, um, Actually, you can see here, you can see that these climate models, in terms of just the magnitude of the overturning circulation, vary quite a bit. Um, and then we can't really see on the time scale of years to decades, but the models disagree about, you know, in the next decades, how much the overturning will change and how rapidly. So it is a big investment right now, but we're hoping that we get a more efficient monitoring system because it's going to take a while uh, because there's considerable noise in the system. It's going to take a while for us to get a signal. But we hope then with the climate models and with the sparser system where you'll have the long-term monitoring. Uh, but the, it took a while to put this together because we had to, um, just different government agencies had to work together to fund it. So, 
We didn't quite have to have a tin cup, but almost. Well, thank you. I rarely ever encounter a lecture in which I think I would have to completely rethink all my assumptions. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in paleoclimate, and there's a kind of an understanding that the the melt, well, I guess it's the freshwater pulses from proglacial pro lakes in you know created the Younger Dryas, this 80 to 100 year of it, and I'm beginning to wonder whether or not any of that might in fact be just untrue. And in fact, it's much more complicated. Maybe all of this circulation you're talking about, uh, we may have to start looking for other reasons. So my focus here is really on what's happening on, I'm going to say, the modern ocean time scale. So on years to decades. And what I was trying to say is that we have assumed that what paleoceanographers understand happens on those large time scales. We've assumed that that same mechanism holds. But we're finding in this years to decade time scale that those assumptions are not true. So certainly if we average over hundreds of years or thousands of years, we may very well recover the overturning circulation. But we don't see it on, on these time scales. So I think what we want to, uh, my message here is that um, in trying to figure out the climate for the years and decades ahead are uh, the construct we have, what the structure of the overturning is and how it would vary, that is what I'm trying to deconstruct. I'm not throwing out all, all paleoceanographic studies. That would be very unfair and unwise. Unwise. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned just once in passing tides. And I was wondering uh, whether, do, do tides have an uh, impact on the overturning situation? So I mentioned it because we need energy. So these deep waters come down, they fill the deep ocean, and we need some source of energy to lift those waters up. Those waters have to up well, and, they have to, and then they have to go back to high latitudes. And so the understanding is that the energy for that comes from tidal dissipation and also the dissipation of the energy that's put in by the winds. But the tides themselves operate on time scales that are really too short to think about. They're not involved dynamically in this in this overturning circulation. It's a question up there. Okay. Um, at one time there was a. At uh, one time, there was a proposal to look at gravimetric data to be able to gain better understanding of ocean circulation. Can you comment on the success of the plans? Yeah, tell me, what, data, what kind of data? Uh, I believe it was from the satellites, uh, the Vosa Oh, gravity data, gravimetric data. Um, to look at ocean circulation? Paul? No. <laughs> It was gravimetric data, um, and there was a proposal to look at the ocean that was called the Ocean Circulation Experiment, and that was attached to either CHAMP or GRACE. Okay, all right, I think I can help here. Um, because I think those gravitational anomalies can tell us something about the movement of, the ma of mass transport. Um, so there was, about 18 months or two years ago, a paper put out. From what I remember, um, is that very coarse, um, very, they are only able to get very coarse pictures of the, of the ocean currents at depths. So I don't, um, I'm going to say it's just in its infancy. Now certainly satellite measures of the ocean surface from altimeters have been giving us a tremendous amount of information about surface current. Those height differences have been giving us a lot of, a lot of information. But, um, my limited understanding of that is that it's still a very crude picture. I wanted to ask something related to that. Your cover slide shows many, many vortices yes. uh, all over the ocean. Uh, I've seen a number of such pictures in films, uh, educational films and so on. And I'm wondering, are those artists' conceptions or are they out of models, or are they out of any kind of observational data? Um, 
basically are they just and they're trying to they see just how them? many gyres there might be. Yeah. Um, those um, that is a is a simulation, is a visualization. Certainly not an art, artistic, you know, rendition. Um, that is from um, a model that is assimilating data. But even if you look, let's say, at sea surface temperature imagery, you will see lots of cyclones, very small features. You'll see filaments coming off, you know, the Gulf Stream. And so I would say the more we look at the ocean, we see features at finer and finer scales. So we have, um, you know, through the years, because we've had sparse measurements, we average over great distances and we get very smooth pictures. But as we're getting more and more observations and more and more observations of the velocity field, we see motion at, at very small scales. So for those of us who are used to looking at these schematics with these ribbons, um, it's a very, it's a strikingly different picture of what we get at the ocean flow field now. And even at depth, you know, it's not just that we have these eddy, you know, features at the surface. We have eddy-driven flow at 2,000 meters. And so you can especially, I mean, if you, if the, the picture that I showed you, I call the spaghetti diagram of floats which go everywhere. So uh, that's not an artist, you know, rendition. Those are floats, you know, at 1,500 meters in the deep ocean following, you know, the, the water and tracing out those what look like chaotic pathways. So it's uh, much more energetic than what we imagined before. I don't think an artist could come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, is where in the back there? There's a fellow in the shadows. Uh, yeah, the talk was uh, very, I, I think the work is very difficult and, and very advanced. It's, you know, this is something uh, something new, I think. I, I'm not in the field, so, but it seems very uh, advanced. I think so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, the question, just, just so that, you know, my question is kind of like a lame question, or, or uh, someone just interested in science question. Uh, 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 you know, uh, if the norm is you know variability, then if something is complex and could could, ar could arbitrarily vary, then that means basically we have no under we have no understanding of it. Uh, uh, so so well, when you use variability, how how does that uh, differ from being dri driven or driven? Uh, for for example, by other um, uh, warming, uh, warming and freshening processes, uh, and there's also the word abrupt. Uh, you know, uh, uh, ten thousand years versus two hundred years. So two hundred years would be pretty abrupt, and and uh, this is what uh, you know the CO two release is uh, less than two hundred years compared to you know paleo paleo changes which might happen over uh, yet ten maybe thousands of years, ten thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, uh, so less than 200 would, would be considered abrupt, and uh, uh, yeah, very. The, the data seems very sparse. So, so what happens when the Lagrangian element changes? Uh, sorry, changes density because you know you only got one flow and then it doesn't split or anything like. I'm going to take a middle question in there, and then maybe work work towards both sides. So. Um, you said that it seems as though since we expect there to be variability that we don't we don't have any understanding. We're actually trying to understand the variability, right? And so um, the key or the, the trick is trying to understand um, whether or not we can relate that variability to some forcing because there's a lot of internal variability. Paul knows this quite well. There's a lot of internal variability in these fluids, both the atmosphere and the ocean. They're chaotic fluids. And so even if we didn't have any external forcing, like we weren't putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we expect a lot of variability. But we're looking uh, for the response of, these, of this fluid, this ocean, to this, this forcing, to changes in the, uh, in the temperature and, and the freshening um, at the surface. So I can't think of any sort of system that doesn't have any variability. And that's really what we're always, you know, after trying to understand what's what's producing that that variability. And now I said I was going to work out from the middle, but I'm trying to remember your first, very first question. But that was the first one. Oh, that was the first question. Second was abrupt. Oh, abrupt. Yeah, well, abrupt. Sure. I mean, you know, um, abrupt is just going to depend on whether you're a paleoceanographer or whether you're like me and, and you study. So, but the study I was citing said that the. Um, 
disruption in the global air temperatures happened on the order of years to decades, not 200 years. So that was the concern, that it wasn't on, you know, 100 or, or on time, your time scales, that it was on time scales of years to decades. Can I ask, can, yeah, of course. can I ask a, a, a really technical question? How do you retrieve the data in practice from OSNAP? Do you have to yank it out of the water and, and pull chips out of it? We have fishing, you know, we have fishing nets, and we just go out there and trawl for those you, instruments. You can't just sit in the comfort of your office and click a button and have all the data. Okay, I do want to tell you that for the Lagrangian floats, yes, this is the beauty because those floats go around for two years, that's about the, their battery life, and then there's an, um, a release on the floats, on the timer, and they pop up to the surface. And you could be sitting there in your coffee shop with a latte and download the data. Yeah, so for oceanographers like me who get seasick, these are great. <laughs> so, but, um, otherwise, like all that moored, the data that's moored and has all those strings of instruments, ships go out, there's acoustic releases, all that flotation comes up, they retrieve it instrument by instrument, take the data out and, and put it back. So it took, we started uh, in May and it took to the end of September to service, to service all of those. So. Can't they float, um, can't the float on the surface? Talk to it. So believe it or not, we are working on where, um, because there's there's a benefit to having, you know, we know um, in, in this point we're taking these measurements. And so um, we are working on ways to try to get that get that information, you know, to, to the surface where it can relay information to a satellite. Um, and so there, it, there are, they are working on essentially drones that can go collect the data and then can go up to the surface, but we're, we're not there yet. We still need our 16th, 17th, 18th century ships that go out. And, uh, the ships aren't that old, I'm just saying that. That's what we're doing. So let's take one, one more question. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, that was an excellent talk. But, thank you. Uh, uh, you mentioned this renegade uh, float uh, that's a trip yes. up to, uh, to England, and uh, you also mentioned that uh, there was uh, the, the reason <coughs> it still gets, gets warming, but from uh, not from the surface water. Yes. What sort of studies, uh, I don't, maybe I missed it, but did you mention a study that actually proves that or shows that? So, um, the, the, we have modeling studies that show that, and then also what we have, um, there, are, there was a, a series of studies done by a program called the Climate Program, where floats were put in um, that can bob between two different isotherms, and they were subsurface isotherms. Uh, there were only 16 of those put out as part of the study. But those floats show that they, uh, in these subsurface waters, the subtropics, they circulate and they are the ones that move subsurface and they start coming up to, to the surface in the, um, in the subpolar North Atlantic. So if you know anything about subtropical mold waters, it's the subtropical mold waters. Uh, those are the waters um, that, that move up. So most of our data is indirect except for those bobbers in part of the program that show that movement. Still pretty sparse. Well I think uh, we'll we'll conclude the formal part of the evening and so let's uh, let's give Dr. Uh,